Four years ago, AMD launched the Ryzen series of processors with the Ryzen 7 1700, 1700X, and 1800X. Built on the Zen architecture, it wasn't specifically designed to be a desktop processor. It was designed to be a server architecture, to take a stab at Intel where it hurt the most. With low core speeds and high cache latencies, they couldn't specifically game as well as Intel processors, but they did have a lot of cores. Especially at time of launch, for just $330, you could buy an 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 1700 for $20 less than you could buy a 4-core 8-thread 7700K that you would normally compare them to. Although nowadays that gap has widened with used 1700s going on eBay for anywhere from between $100 to $140, where 7700Ks are still pulling over $200. And pairing this with a equally reasonably priced uh, B350 or B450 motherboard can be a very attractive combination. So the only question is, should you buy a Ryzen 7 1700? Well, today we're going to take a quick look at uh, how it's holding up in 2021. Also, just as a side note, Windows 11 doesn't specifically state support for the first generation of Ryzen processors yet. Although, if you did end up with one with a B450 motherboard, you definitely have a lot of CPUs you could pair that with to uh, have support for Windows 11 should you ever need it. So today we have a Ryzen 7 1700 running under a best case scenario. It has a 280mm custom loop attached to it on a X370 motherboard with 16 gigabytes of 3200 megahertz running at 3000 megahertz, and I'll get to that in a second, with a RTX 3070 to make sure it doesn't bottleneck on any of our 1080p benchmarks today. So today we're gonna take a look at some synthetic benchmarks, some gaming benchmarks, and just because we can, we'll go ahead and include the same benchmarks run at uh, four gigahertz all core because we have really nothing else to compare it to. And for our four gigahertz overclock, I just wanna show you guys what we used for it. In uh, advanced frequency, we just used a core multiplier of 40. And then in voltage settings, we just ran a 1.375 core voltage. And then we set the low line calibration to four on the V core. So that's all we did. It's quick and dirty, but it runs nice and cool under our 280 millimeter radiator. Now for memory speed, we ran it at uh, XMP, but then we just turned the memory multiplier to 30 because anything over that, if you put it on Prime 95 or open up any game, it will crash nearly immediately. So 3000 megahertz is pretty much the max that you're gonna run A1700 with on any set of RAM. Some sets of RAM might not even boot this high. It's very picky about what kind of memory you're using. I'm just gonna go ahead and load optimized defaults just so I can get an idea of how it runs out of the box. So while this is booting, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the community. I put a lot of effort into making this as scientific as possible. So if you like this video and want to see future hardware reviews, get subscribed. Now that we're booted up and in uh, Hardware Info 64, you can see that uh, our base speeds are about 3.2 gigahertz, but if it does get too hot, it will clock down to about three gigahertz. And under good circumstances, it will boost up to 3.75. Now it's boosting up to 3.7, but there's an extra 50 megahertz in there from the XFR range or extended frequency range where non-XQs get 50 megahertz and XQs like the 1800X will get an extra 100 megahertz. Now I did boot it in at uh, 3200 megahertz just because I wanted to show you guys what happens when your memory isn't stable. So if you go ahead and open up Prime95 and launch large FFTs, after about a minute or so, the self-tests will start failing. So after a minute, our self-tests start failing, showing uh, errors. So that's just showing that our memory speed is just running too fast for this uh, poor old memory controller. <laughs> Oh, it's even going to crash. <laughs> so yeah, if your memory is not stable, nothing is. Now that we're back in Windows, we can see it idle at about 20 watts. Now overclocking will increase idle power consumption to 25 watts. Where stock under load, it will get up to 67 watts, which is a little bit over what it's rated for. But overclocking will increase power consumption massively to 155 watts under load. So keep that in mind if you're trying to overclock this thing. So first up, we're gonna run Cinebench R23. It takes forever to run, but stock it managed a kind of curiously low 7,765 multi and 886 single core. Overclocking increased it massively to 9,862 multi and 1,029 single, possibly indicating that uh, the stock settings on this motherboard are not letting it run uh, as well as it could. Moving on to the Blender BMW benchmark, Stock, it managed a respectable 4 minute, 28 second pass. 
Well, overclocked, it crushed that, taking a little more than a minute less at 3 minutes and 34 seconds. Moving on to some gaming benchmarks. Up first, we have Shadow the Benchmark, maxed out running at uh, 96 FPS average, with highs of 142 and lows of 64. Overclocking does not have a huge effect on this game, increasing the average to 103 with highs of 161 and lows of 70. Up next is Metro Exodus All Low Settings, where we found a average FPS of 108 with highs of 156 and lows of 62. Overclocking did have a okay uplift of about 10 FPS to an average of 121 with highs of 174 and lows of 73. Surprisingly, our next benchmark of uh, Grand Theft Auto all maxed out scored relatively similar to uh, Metro Exodus did on all low with a stock average of 103 FPS and highs of 153 and lows of 56. And then like Metro, we saw a gain of about 10 FPS from overclocking to 121 average and 170 FPS highs with a low of 79. Now for some more current year and popular titles. First up, we ran Cyberpunk, all low settings, and uh, crowded NPCs. I walked the same path for both clock settings because the game doesn't have a built-in benchmark. Stock, we saw averages of 69 FPS. Nice, get subscribed. Highs of 87 and lows of 51. Overall, a very playable experience. Overclocked, we saw a 10 FPS increase again, up to 79 FPS, with highs of 97 and lows of 52 FPS. I went ahead and ran Doom Eternal. Again, this game doesn't have a built-in benchmark, but the 1700 has no trouble turning over 200 FPS at uh, stock clock speeds, sometimes cresting 300. Damn, Vulcan is really well optimized. Overclocking, again, just lifted it up even more. Like, Doom, you really wouldn't have any trouble playing this game. On to some popular multiplayer titles. First up, I ran Call of Duty Warzone, all low settings, and then I dropped into a private match and didn't start monitoring until I landed. Once on the ground, we saw stock averages of 139 FPS, with highs of 156 and lows of 119. Overclocking did some good for this title, boosting the averages to 159, with a high of 178 and a low of 137. Then I went ahead and ran Fortnite. Man, I hate this game, but my nephews love it. Stock averages were good at 227 and a high of 365, but the game isn't really stable with lows down to 106, which can be quite jarring at times. Overclocking didn't do too much for this title, with averages only nudging up to 233, highs were a little bit higher at 387, and lows were mostly unaffected at uh, 109. I think an important takeaway from this uh, title is that uh, my benchmarking method might not be as good as it could with the 1700, as the game fluctuates quite a lot. Either way, it's very playable on the 1700. Then we tried out some Valorant, all low settings on the practice map. Stock speeds, we saw an impressive 283 FPS with highs of 338 and lows of 202. Overclocking had a good effect on averages, bumping it to 314 with highs of 371 and lows of 214. And lastly, the king of CPU benchmarking, CSGO on Mr. Uletical's benchmark map. All low settings at 1080p, we saw a very respectable 280-ish FPS, and overclocking had a huge benefit, boosting it up to a whopping 350 FPS. That's all we have for benchmarks today. Again, not too bad of a CPU overall. Now onto some pretty objective opinions. Now, if I was building a PC today for about $500, I would definitely pair it with something like a Radeon R9 290X. Now, this graphics card you can get off of eBay for about $150 right now. So if you're wanting to build something, you need it now, and it can play some 1080p titles. Well, actually it'll play most 1080p titles, Cyberphone, but it should do really good. Now the most I would pair with this processor at 1080p is a GTX 1070 Ti, or a Radeon 5600 XT is about the same area as this, along with a, a Vega 56 or a 64. Now, if I was playing games at 1440p on this processor, I would definitely move up into the 5700 XT or uh, 2070 area. Obviously, a, uh, a Radeon 7 will match performance of those, but it's so expensive, I can't see anybody wanting to use that for gaming right now. And then beyond that, to like a 3060 Ti to a 3070, I just would not pair it with the 1700. A 3600, a 10400, or a 5600X at least 
would be for uh, reserved for those cards, like the price to performance, especially at 1080p. Like if you're playing 1080p, do not even try to look past a 5700 XT. You will be bottlenecking the sin out of your card. <laughs> and graphics cards are not something that you want to be uh, wasting money on right now. So if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, get subscribed. If you have any thoughts, comments, concerns, leave them down in the comments or hop in our Discord and let us know. And like always, guys, I'll see you next time.